In November 2023, the Armenian Prime Minister skipped the latest summit meeting of the Russian-led Collective Security Treaty Organization, widely seen as a direct snub to the Russian President Vladimir Putin. The decision is a particularly public sign of the growing tensions between Yerevan and Moscow. Naturally, this has fed speculation that the two countries are now on course for a final break, especially as Armenia has also been building relations with the West. But is Armenia really ready to make such a fundamental strategic and geopolitical shift? Hello and welcome. If you're new to the channel, my name is James Kerlinzi, and here I take an informed look at international relations, conflict, security and statehood. The war in Ukraine has seen many European countries radically reevaluate their foreign policy orientation. For some, such as Sweden and Finland, this has meant casting aside long-held neutrality and pursuing NATO membership. For others, such as Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, this has been primarily focused on pressing ahead with speedy European Union integration. But there's one country on the periphery of Europe where the geopolitical shift has been much more muted. Armenia. Since the end of the Cold War, it's remained closely tied to Russia. However, these ties have recently come under unprecedented strain. As a result, it now appears to be reconsidering its overall strategic direction. And yet, as much as it may seem to want to make a final break with Moscow and align itself with the West, the decision isn't quite as easy as it may seem. The Republic of Armenia lies in the South Caucasus. Landlocked, to its north is Georgia, to its west is Turkey, and to its south is Iran. To its east, it neighbours Azerbaijan, which also has an enclave, Nakhchivan, along Armenia's southwest border. The population currently stands at around 2.8 million. This is almost entirely comprised of ethnic Armenians who are almost exclusively Christian and speak an Indo-European language. On top of this, a further 7 million or so Armenians make up an extensive diaspora community stretching across North America, Europe, the Middle East and Oceania. Its per capita GDP is around 8,200 US dollars, making it a middle income country. The Armenians have an extraordinarily long, complex and fascinating history. Having emerged at some point before the 6th century BC, their strategic location at the crossroads between Europe and Asia saw them encounter many of the great ancient powers, including the Hellenistic Empire of Alexander the Great and the Persians. And while they eventually established an extensive kingdom of their own, stretching from the Mediterranean to the Caspian Seas, they were later caught between the imperial rivalry of the Romans and the Parthians. This would also extend into the Middle Ages. Although the Armenians became the first nation to adopt Christianity in 301 AD, in the 7th century they came under Arab Islamic rule until 885 when a new independent Armenian kingdom was established. This existed until the middle of the 11th century when the Byzantine Empire absorbed it. After that, Armenia would come under pressure from the Seljuk Turks and the Mongols until, in the 16th century, the Ottoman Empire conquered the western areas and the east came under Persian imperial rule. Although this led to frequent conflicts, the two empires retained control over the Armenians for the next several hundred years. But by the start of the 19th century, a new imperial power was emerging, Russia. Having seized control of eastern Armenia from Persia in 1828, it began moving against the Ottoman Empire, prompting several major Armenian rebellions. This all came to a head during the First World War. In 1915, and facing another uprising, the Ottoman leadership ordered the forcible expulsion of up to one and a half million Armenians from its eastern provinces, a decision that many now recognise as an act of genocide. But as the First World War ended and the Ottoman Empire lay in ruins, Armenia seized the opportunity to declare independence. However, the new country was short-lived. In September 1920, communist Russian forces invaded, creating the Soviet Republic of Armenia. Then, two years later, this was united with neighbouring Azerbaijan and Georgia to form the Transcaucasian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. 
This in turn lasted until 1936 when Transcaucasia was dissolved and Armenia finally emerged as a separate top-level Soviet Socialist Republic. Although the Soviet Union eventually collapsed in 1991 and Armenia became an independent sovereign state, joining the United Nations on the 2nd of March 1992, it would nevertheless retain close links to Russia. Like most other of the former Soviet republics, it joined the new Commonwealth of Independent States. But on top of this, the relationship with Moscow was also shaped by other crucial factors. As well as maintaining close economic relations with Russia, Armenia continued to host a Russian military base. But most importantly, the relationship was shaped by the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the breakaway region of Nagorno-Karabakh. Although Russia officially remained neutral and co-led international efforts to find a solution, many saw it as favouring Armenia, not least of all by providing it with arms. Moreover, the fact that Armenia had taken control of large swathes of Azerbaijani territory then led to tensions with neighbouring NATO member Turkey, which retained close ties to Azerbaijan and imposed an embargo on Armenia. Squeezed between Ankara and Baku, this also underscored the need for Armenia to retain close links to Moscow. This was highlighted in 2002 when Armenia became a part of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the CSTO, a military alliance comprising six former Soviet states, including Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. But the relationship between Yerevan and Moscow would become especially significant in 2003, with Russia's ties to the West deteriorating rapidly, a revolution in neighbouring Georgia toppled the pro-Russian leadership, and as the new administration openly pushed for NATO membership, fears grew that other states could follow suit, including Armenia. But while Yerevan began to signal that it wanted closer ties to the European Union, joining the EU's Eastern Partnership in May 2009, this abruptly ended in 2013. Despite having all but completed negotiations for a free trade agreement with the EU, Armenia suddenly announced that it had decided to join the new Russian-led Eurasian Economic Union instead. And while Armenia subsequently signed a new comprehensive and enhanced partnership agreement with the EU in 2017, by this stage it seemed firmly committed to its relationship with Russia. However, this all began to change in 2018, when the long-standing government in Yerevan was ousted following widespread protests that brought to power a new reformist prime minister, Nikol Pashinyan. Although Pashinyan initially stated his intention to maintain close ties to Russia, repeatedly reassuring the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, that he wanted to keep the alliance, suspicions nevertheless grew on both sides. While Moscow mistrusted the democratic government in Yerevan, Armenia became increasingly concerned about thawing relations between Russia and Azerbaijan. This would all come to a head just two years later when, after almost a quarter of a century, Azerbaijan launched a military campaign to retake Nagorno-Karabakh. Having invested in building up its military capabilities on the back of its expanding energy exports, Azerbaijani forces quickly retook the occupied areas. However, just as they prepared to launch a final assault on Nagorno-Karabakh, Russia stepped in at the very last moment to broker a ceasefire that would be overseen by a Russian peacekeeping force. Azerbaijan's victory came as a massive blow for Armenia. While Nagorno-Karabakh still existed, it was now under effective Azerbaijani control. More to the point, this led to widespread resentment against Russia. As well as blaming Moscow for failing to prevent the war, many Armenians also argued that Russia could have stepped in earlier to stop the fighting. As a result, relations between Yerevan and Moscow steadily deteriorated. As well as a growing frostiness between Pashinyan and Putin, Russia openly criticised the Armenian Prime Minister, thereby straining diplomatic relations. Meanwhile, as Moscow built closer ties to Azerbaijan, Armenia began engaging more openly with US and European leaders. Moreover, much to Moscow's anger, it also started to provide humanitarian aid to Ukraine. 
However, the depth to which relations had sunk was most obviously highlighted in September 2023 when Azerbaijan launched a fresh attack against Nagorno-Karabakh. This time, Russia made absolutely no effort to stop the conflict. As Azerbaijani forces took complete control of the region, its remaining 100,000 or so inhabitants fled to Armenia. Since then, relations have seemingly collapsed. This was first highlighted when Armenia ratified its participation in the International Criminal Court, a move Moscow vehemently condemned given ongoing investigations into alleged Russian war crimes in Ukraine. And it was against this backdrop that Pashinyan boycotted the latest CSTO summit. Calling the decision an anti-Russian move orchestrated by the West, the snub was no doubt felt even more strongly by Moscow as it came just after Pashinyan wrapped up a high-profile trip to France. So, does this now mean that Armenia will break from Russia and move towards the West? While this may seem where things are headed, the situation isn't quite so straightforward. First of all, while Armenia may be prepared to abandon the CSTO, switching its allegiance to NATO would be extremely difficult, if not impossible. While many NATO countries would certainly be delighted to welcome Armenia, the deep-rooted tensions between Armenia and Turkey mean that Ankara, and perhaps even Hungary, would almost certainly block any application. But even if Turkey didn't veto membership, it would almost certainly demand an unacceptably high price as well as calling for Armenia to drop genocide accusations relating to the events of 1915, it could well condition membership on granting Azerbaijan a land corridor to Nakhchivan, especially as this would create an unbroken transport link between Turkey and Central Asia. But if joining NATO is out of the question, what about EU membership instead? In many ways, this is a more logical and feasible option. The fact that neighbouring Georgia has just been recommended for candidacy indicates that the Union is certainly open to Caucasus expansion. Curiously, however, this just doesn't seem to be on Armenia's agenda. Notwithstanding Georgia's progress, Armenians just don't see this as a realistic possibility for two very different reasons. First of all, it's shaped by a widespread sense that the EU wouldn't want Armenia. Even though there's a solid pro-Armenian lobby across Europe and many observers would see it as a natural candidate, most Armenians genuinely think that it isn't a realistic aspiration. Secondly, there are concerns about the broader societal implications of joining the EU. Armenia remains a largely conservative country. As one civil society activist noted, joining the EU will require liberalisation, such as greater LGBT rights. Interestingly, these attitudes about EU membership appear to be encouraged by Russia, which appears to be waging an active disinformation campaign through its broadcasts into the country. As a result, this combination of reticence and reluctance is reflected in public opinion polling. Although around half the population appear to favour EU membership, this is significantly lower than support for accession in almost any other potential member. But there's also another important element. In the minds of Armenians, the West cannot provide the security they need. As they see it, the real threat remains Turkey and Azerbaijan. And although Nagorno-Karabakh has been lost, there are fears that Azerbaijan will now try to seize the country's south, thus creating a land bridge to Nakhchivan. If Baku does launch an attack, they simply feel that the West would be unable or unwilling to prevent this from happening. In their minds, and notwithstanding Moscow's recent failures to stop Azerbaijan from taking Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenians seem to believe that the only actor that could still prevent this from happening is Russia especially as any move to divide Armenia would remove an essential link to neighbouring Iran, which has emerged as a key Russian ally. Ultimately, and perhaps reflecting their long history as a nation caught between the rival competing powers of the day, most Armenians believe that they must simply accept the current situation. While they no longer trust Russia, they feel that abandoning it altogether and pursuing closer Western ties isn't an option. At least, for now. I hope you found that interesting. If so, 
please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. In the meantime, here are some more videos that you might find interesting. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next video.